Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our students, our guests here in the room, and also on Zoom. We've got a live audience. We're streaming this. Uh, I'm Maya Nguyen, Director of the Design Lab. I'm here with Karthik Ramakrishnan, Executive Director of California 100. And we are excited to have our second Design at Large uh, series of speakers. Last week, we talked about alternative transportation futures. And this week, we get to talk about climate change and how technology can be used and harnessed in order to mitigate and prepare us for um, climate risks. Um, and so we get to talk to some real experts, some, some preeminent scholars and, and practitioners um, about the topic of climate change today. Uh, but to tell us more about um, California's long-term future and also about this topic, I'm going to turn it over to Karthik. Thank you so much, Mai, and thank you, everyone, for um, not only having us here, but being such amazing partners um, in the work. Um, California 100 uh, is a relatively new uh, initiative. It's a statewide effort uh, to envision uh, a, a much better future for California. And what do we mean by better? We want a state, not only a state of innovation, but a state of inclusion. Core values in the work are innovation, resilience, inclusion, sustainability, and equity. It spells I rise. Um, and, and we know that California is often seen as the conscience of the country and as a global leader when it comes to a lot of this work. But there are many other entities among us now, especially when it comes to um, climate change uh, and environmental sustainability more generally. The kind of long-term thinking that we're going to be talking about today is not new to California. I mean, we'll hear about how Native peoples in California have been doing long-range intergenerational work on sustainability for much longer than there has been a California. But even coming more closer to the present, thinking about the kind of clean air regulations that California pioneered and essentially got the federal government to agree to a set of waivers that created a California standard that many other states follow. Now that's been in contention in recent years, uh, depending on who's in the White House. But that's the kind of thinking that California needs and that you'll see in this report. California is already doing some of this work. The work we do here is so consequential. As you, many of you may have heard, we're the fifth largest economy uh, in the world. Many of us, many, we have our governor who has talked about us as being a nation state, even though you know, we can't print our own money and you know, stand our own armies and the like. Um, but shy of that, what we're trying to figure out is what, 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 can we, what are the limits of what we can do given our legal framework, constitutional framework, political realities of today, but really to imagine what is possible and then create the conditions for that to occur. So to not take many of the constraints that we see today as, as given, but things that could likely change uh, if we put our best minds and our best efforts to it. Um, many of you have had the chance to read the report. You can see it at california100.org. What we've done is work with some of the strongest research centers uh, around the state uh, that have national reputations in these particular issue areas and get them to stretch. I say this as someone who, uh, who has a background in political science and political behavior, um, some background in demographics, and who gets very uncomfortable thinking about predictions or projections beyond five to 10 years. But we're not projecting into the future. What we're doing is considering different scenarios that seem implausible today, but that could be very likely 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now. Part of that work is what we do uh, with a two by two scenario framework. So um, our research experts in different issue areas, and in this case, it's the um, Environmental Policy uh, Center and the Goldman School of Public Policy worked with various stakeholders as well as their own researchers to come up with two dimensions that could lay out four different futures for California. And this is not in the very long term. This is something in the next 10 to 20 years. And essentially, these two dimensions relate to whether or not we have a political will to, um, to tackle uh, climate change in a, in, a, in a big and transformative way. And then whether or not um, the economic realities support the kind of bold investments we need. 
So that's how we get these two by two scenarios. I think previously you saw some artwork uh, to, to, to suggest what those four different scenarios could be um, for California. Danny Kennedy is one of our commissioners uh, who's been advising us in this work along with Louise Bedsworth who uh, co-chairs the um, energy and environment track for California 100. That's all I'll say about California 100 for now. Really looking forward to the conversation uh, from our expert panelists. Great. Well, we're really excited to have this esteemed panel here. Lori Johnson, Danny Kennedy, Ilke Altintas, and Michael Ponce-Mentier. Let's welcome them. So I'm going to start with Lori. Um, Lori is the Chief Catastrophe Response and Resiliency Officer, a big job in California, right? This is for the California Earthquake Authority and the newly established California Wildfire Fund. And she's also a globally recognized urban planner who's helped communities really think about the complex challenges of post by disasters. Um, as one of the most populous states and also the largest economies, as Karthik just mentioned, um, you have a really big job, especially at a time when disasters and extreme weather events are becoming more extreme and more frequent, right? Um, you know, we've got in California droughts, wildfires, heat, storms, flooding, you name it, earthquakes, right? We've got all of it. Um, so talk to us about the difference between mitigating these disasters and adapting to these disasters. Well, thank you for that question, and thank you all for coming. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this, I think, one of the things, as I was reflecting on this, as somebody who was an earth scientist who became an urban planner, uh, my, my career, a lot of my career is really focused around earthquakes. We can't yet predict earthquakes, and we can't stop earthquakes from happening. We can, we can mitigate the effects of earthquakes, but we can't actually mitigate the cause. And that's where climate change is so interesting to me as a design professional, and for many of you in this room, we actually, as design professionals, can mitigate the cause. We can mitigate it through how we build uh, our built environment in, in particular. And California has really led the way of the world in thinking about that, going back to 2006, well, actually some initial work was done in 2000, 2001, but 2006, the Global Warming Solutions Act was passed, AB, Assembly Bill 32. And that actually set in motion a tremendous amount of work that's gone on for the past 15, coming on 20 years, um, to actually mitigate greenhouse gas emission in California and show other states and other countries how to do this. And people at the time said, oh my gosh, we can't do this. This is too big, kind of going to Carthage's point. It's too much of a stretch. It'll kill California's economy. And what we've proven is actually that's not the case. We can actually mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're, we've exceeded the targets we set for 2020. Uh, and as you may know, the governor has now basically raised the target to go to net zero um, neutral, carbon neutrality by 2050, is it? 45. 2045, thank you. Uh, so that just shows how, how aggressive we've been in that front. And there's a whole bunch of stuff I could talk to on the side of, of mitigation. But what's interesting is that when you look at other natural hazards, we typically talk about hazard mitigation as being what is really in the climate world more talked about as adaptation. And so that's really how do we deal with the effects of, of climate change. And those effects are, as Mai just said, you know, the, the negative effects are um, sea level rise, flooding, increased rainfall, uh, drought, you know, more variable rainfall, uh, which affects our water supply in California, uh, and uh, wildfires, and, um, and extreme heat. And on this side of the policy equation, there's a lot of great things that happened uh, because California is a very populous state and because we had big events happen of other kinds of perils like earthquakes. There's actually a, a strong foundation of work that has allowed us to start to build the toolkit to deal with ab adaptation. For example, uh, after a big earthquake in Los Angeles in 1971, the state said, hey, when a local government does its general plan, basically the sort of land use doctrine of a city, uh, that you actually need to have another element in that general plan, another piece, another chapter of your general plan needs to deal with seismic safety. 
And that safety element now is being adapted to deal with all the effects of climate change. So there's been legislation done uh, recently that, that has added over time wildfires, flooding, addressing climate uh, change ver vulnerability as well as adaptation, all of that having to fit into the safety element of a general plan and that our plan needs to be consistent. So you can't say in one element of the plan, hey, we're going to tackle climate change and we're going to reduce um, our, our exposure to flooding, but then have land use going right into the floodplain. So there's le the, we have the, the teeth that sort of ties that together. And that might sound like kind of a practical thing to you, but that's actually unique in urban planning. There are, I, I think, less than a dozen states that actually require hazards to be addressed in local plans. And many states don't even require cities to plan. So these are foundational things that are allowing us now to add more teeth into uh, the work that we're doing for different kinds of hazards. Unfortunately, I think we tend to be a little bit more reactive when it comes to the adaptation piece than we have been on the mitigation side. And so it's what you see is sort of a slew of legislation that typically follows uh, an event. So we've had a slew of legislation in 2017, 2018, when we had the drought. Uh, and then now it's been the last couple of years, we've really uh, invested a lot in wildfire related uh, legislation. So now instead of just looking at fighting fires, which is where the predominantly in the past our money went to, we're now doing much more, investing much more in vegetation management and home hardening uh, and, and, um, and, and other aspects of prevention and evacuation planning. Uh, but with that foundation of work uh, really stems from the other hazards and really has given us a, a leg up to start to deal with adaptation. Where I'd say we're still kind of weak is really thinking about sea level rise because that requires coordination among our jurisdictions that are on the water's edge, which really takes regional leadership. Uh, and so some regions are kind of getting going on that in California and some not as much. Um, our Coastal Commission is doing a lot. We have a statewide agency that deals with the whole coast um, that's looking at that. So again, something that we have that many other states don't have that we're building on. Uh, and the other one that we're just starting to think about is extreme heat. Uh, just last year, the state's update of the state adaptation strategy included the chapter for the first time an action plan on extreme heat. Uh, so, so, you know, when you kind of look at sort of our, our progress so far on all, on all of these hazards, I'd say we're, we're dealing fairly well with flooding. We're dealing now better with wildfire, but we're probably going to see the benefits of that in more in two or three, maybe five years from now. Uh, we've been dealing uh, with uh, drought um, and going to do more in that front, but we need to do more work when it comes to thinking about sea level rise and thinking about extreme heat. Thanks, Lori. I'm going to turn to Danny, CEO of, of New Energy Nexus. And New Energy Nexus is a global platform organization for funds and incubators with chapters in U the USA, Asia, as well as Africa. And he's working to connect entrepreneurs to capital in order to build an abundant clean energy economy uh, that is equitable and works for, for all of us. Um, I'm going to maybe uh, tap into what Lori just said about how, you know, when we first start to come up with new technologies like solar, everybody says it's too expensive to adopt, right? It's too costly. Uh, or um, electric vehicles, for example, right? But we're, we're in California, we're, we're already there. We're adopting all of these technologies. But um, we're not, it's probably not as equitable as we want it to be. So in underserved communities, for example, how are we doing in terms of this transition of energy um, in underserved communities and how can we make them, we make it so that they can benefit from this transition and also make their communities more livable? You know, some, some good news is for, not just that in 2006 we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, thank you Fran Pavley and setting California on, on that train, but this month, We've been on several days at 97% wind and solar powered in the electricity system of the state of California, 97%, fifth largest economy in the world. When we passed that puppy in 2006, had we said in 2022, we're gonna be close to 100% wind and solar powered. Yeah, bullshit, you're not. It's not possible. It literally was not possible. So we did it, we did the impossible. And, and that's one of the things California kind of does. And so to the question of, you know, how do we ensure that this energy transition happens in an equitable way that brings 
all the benefits to everyone and particularly those that were hurt worst and first by the fossil fuel histories and heritage we have and, and the weirding of the weather that's coming. You know, that is our challenge now. This transition is unstoppable. I mean, 10 years from now, you won't remember what an internal combustion engine car was. You won't have many options to buy one. And 15 years from now, it'll be illegal to sell one in the state first. Uh, at least you can probably sell them secondhand. But that, I don't know whether you know that, but that's where the law is going. 2035, ICE vehicles, no more in California. So like then shortly thereafter, we won't remember. I mean, how many of you rode here on an electric scooter? That technology wasn't available five years ago because lithium ion batteries weren't powerful enough to carry this 200 pound man across the campus, which I just tried to do and then it stopped me because I wasn't allowed to ride in that zone. But, uh, you know, the, the, the technology transition is fast and furious, to coin a phrase. Um, but how do we ensure that it gets into East LA, into the chop shops? How do we ensure that, you know, the folk that are doing the work in the internal combustion engine industry are trained to work on EVs and uh, make them work and stay on the roads and, and safe and all the rest of it? We need to invest in policies that are out of the box and, and doing different design now in preparation for this future that we kind of can't imagine is so close because we've got this heuristic of the last century and we're so stuck in the past that we think the future is going to be like it was. It's going to be very different. And so my answer to the how do we do it, how do we ensure, is we support entrepreneurs, particularly from those disadvantaged area communities, particularly, you know, the, the women that have been left out of the venture capital game. You know, 94% of all venture capital, for example, goes to white males. Terrible, shocking statistic, but true. You know, idiot investment strategy because they've just left on the table the genius of half the world's population, women and people of color, duh, you're missing all the smart deals that no one else is investing in. So we go out and we find innovators and entrepreneurs that are from the places of adversity that are facing the unequal distribution of the burden of air pollution, of the impacts of heat waves and crises and wildfires and droughts and all the rest of it. And, you know, in California, that means going to what, it, you know, under the environmental screening methodology is literally disadvantaged area communities in Central Valley and inland counties of Southern California. And, and we find and fund and foster those startups and those innovators, and we get them to lead the way and find the solutions that are coming. And the good news is they're, they're driving amazing things. I mean, you know, just to name an example, a company that we got out of a hackathon, not similar to the process for generating these ideas here, maybe eight years ago at a, an Oakland incubator, was trying to deal with how do you do demand response in an electricity grid with modern variable inputs like wind and solar. And they came up with a gamification strategy cell phones and in everyone's pockets, we can turn this into this kind of cool tool to get people to beat their neighbors at saving energy during flex your out of power hours, if you know those campaigns. And so it's called OmConnect. They're now in hundreds of thousands of homes. One of the other tra strategies they've developed as they've pivoted is a smart plug they put in the wall between the, the electricity grid and your fridge. And if you're giving them permission, they'll turn your fridge off for half an hour when there's a flex your hour power and they'll pay you the demand charge that they save. So effectively, you get paid to save energy. And this is mostly Central Valley communities, mostly low-income families getting paid to participate in the demand response strategies of the electricity grid of California as it balances this wild variable input of the wind and solar that's now at 97% some days. Just as one example, but you know, solar is now no longer an expensive proposition, it's actually the lower cost proposition for a residential consumer in California. Like, if you can afford it, that's a big if, can you afford it, it's a green discount. It's not a green premium. You save money on your electricity bill monthly if you go solar. Okay, not everyone can afford it up front, so they need it financed. Not everyone can get a loan or a lease because they don't have a FICO score. So we need innovators to develop credit scoring and credit products that can apply to those communities. And that's happening at scale and speed. And PACE was a great Californian innovation and innovated by a, a city, not a, a private sector entrepreneur. Same with EVs. You know, we've got lots of like the free EV program. If you go and search e spring free EV is a program for gig economy workers to get electric vehicles because, you know, the pain at the pump is so great now 
that gig workers can't drive Uber and Lyft and so on unless they get in an EV. And there's this whole program to finance the adoption of EVs for gig economy drivers who can't otherwise afford it, which is a, a business developed by an entrepreneur here in Southern California. I could bore you to death with lots more examples, but suffice to say it's happening. It's actually cheaper, better, faster than you think, and it is applying to the communities that we're most concerned about rightly f for a just and equitable outcome in this energy transition. And the people that are going to deliver it are the entrepreneurs of California, which, guess what, are who have always innovated and created the great futures for California. Great. Sounds like we need to invest in entrepreneurs, but in the end, they'll, it'll pay for itself, right? Um, 100%. So I'm going to turn to Ilke. Um, Chief Data Science Officer of the San Diego Supercomputer Center and also our co-sponsor for today. Uh, LK is also the founding director of the Workflows of Data Science Center of Excellence and the Wi-Fi Lab. And her work really cuts across scientific and so societal domains, including bioinformatics, geoinformatics, smart cities, smart manufacturing. She does a lot. So <laughs> um, talk to us about how... Um, this next generation of fire science using technology and data, how, like artificial intelligence, for example, how this can be used for mitigation in response to wildfires. Thank you, and I think one thing to recognize about these fires is it's climate-induced as much as other reasons. And you know, our climate is changing fast, but the factors and human involvement in these are influence in what we call the wildland urban interface also uh, is a big contributor. On top of that, as you said, over the last hundred years, fire suppression policy uh, is was we, we actually suppress any fire we can. So what that means is when the fire is low intensity, it's suppressed. And Fire is inevitable in nature. Actually, it's needed in nature. Some seeds won't see the ecosystems need to be healthy through fire. So if we suppress all these, what happens is we actually have a fire deficit. That means we have too little fire. Then you can say it's counterintuitive, right? Why are we having so many news of these wildfires or the mega fires? Because because of having too little low intensity fire, which are the good fires that nature needs, we start having fires when we can't control them, the bad fires. And we learn as a society to be scared of fire instead of living with it and being at peace with it. So you can tell the difference between being at peace and being at war, right? We are at war right now and we are constantly in reactive mode when the fire comes and hits us. We are trying to hit it fast and respond to it. It's a very reactive regime. And the fire itself is changing behavior, and we are developing more science and technology to fight it. But I think our thinking is now shifting as a nation. With the recent infrastructure bill, for instance, there are new approaches to increase mitigation measures. One of them is a prescribed fire or vegetation treatment. With those, we are learning now can we use more science and technology and science-driven policy through putting fire on the ground more in a scalable fashion so that we can actually clean some of these aspects, that ve uh, like vegetation accumulation is one of them, so that when we have a wildfire situation, at least they'll be less intense, uh, less devastating, and you know we can start balancing. But one of the measures in California, for instance, we can burn through prescribed fire to clean low intensity fire 100,000 acres. And now there's a thing called a uh, million acre strategy. We need to burn 10 times as much, a million acres a year for 20 years to bring the ecosystem ba back to a healthy state. So these are important things. And science and technology, we do that really well in California. How do we now? create human-centered design solutions to create user-inspired products so we can actually get what we build through science and technology to the hands of practical communities, to policymakers, to emergency management. So in all phases of emergency management, from response to 
recovery, but also preparedness and mitigation. All of these can use more science and technology. And if we can bridge that gap between uh, science to practice, so to say, or science and technology to practice. Right now, it's the average of 10 years for something to be useful. Can we cut that down to two years? And we work under the National Science Foundation <laughs> in an accelerator program for convergence research. And the goal there is to increase collaboration, a cross-sector collaboration and public-private partnerships. So we can, in two years, maybe put the solutions out there so we can get to those solutions. So I think the bottom line is there are so many things we do well and we are learning from the impact of the climate and what we are experiencing and we need to learn to collaborate. That is a good segue to our next panelist, Michael, who is a Na National Science Foundation program director um, and also a part of the Convergence Accelerator where he leads two tracks AI, uh, this is artificial intelligence, innovation, and trust and authenticity in communication systems. And Michael, we were talking earlier about how important it is to um, have these cross-disciplinary collaborations in order to move the needle forward on some of these really complex societal issues like climate change, right? So can you talk about why this Convergence Accelerator was started and why it's necessary and what you're doing in terms of taking science out of the university and into the real world. Um, so the Convergence Accelerator was started uh, and basically because we have a lot of m just enormous challenges facing us as a society and they can't be solved by a single technology, a single um, discipline of research. It has to be a combination of a lot of different areas. And so what we're doing is enforcing on our researchers to go out and find people from other disciplines. And you can hear some of that in what Danny was talking about, of course, Ilkai, who's in our program. But when you look at, you know, for instance, uh, some of the climate or some of the energy, uh, renewable energy strides that have been made, that required policy that required and the gamification tool that's how do you get humans engaged in this that's not just we're going we have all this great you know solar technology or wind technology you had to have an impetus to put it to use and that's where the policy and the human element came into this and so what we've you know look at our teams and we say okay you've got great you've got a computer set of computer scientists to solve this problem well okay who's going to use the tool are you thinking about who's going to use it are you thinking about these other aspects that are going to drive adoption and then as we looked at it on another dimension, like where do you, how do you do that kind of outreach or how do you bring in the expertise to combine with researchers and academics to actually build stuff? Because, you know, if you're, if you understand the, uh, understanding a topic and researching a topic is very different than building a product. And so what we said is you, not only do you have to have all of these different disciplines that are going to help you solve the problem, but you also have to have the right combinations of types of organizations. So. Uh, academic institutions, nonprofits, government, private sector, and you bring all of these groups together to take advantage of the knowledge, the expertise, the capabilities of all of them to solve the grand challenges that we have. And so that's that's really where we where we um, began. And, and of course, in the context of the National Science Foundation, we fund so much basic research. How do we start getting more outputs? How do we start getting more um, impact from the, all of the billions of dollars of basic research that we're funding because there's a lot of impact that comes out of it but many times that's years down the line so how do we accelerate that process build that connection so that we can take the outputs of the basic research we're funding and turn it into products of all sorts whether it's software hardware education systems uh, procedures policy well we don't do policy specifically because that gets us into trouble as a federal agency, but we can do things that do drive decision making as the outputs of the projects that we're um, funding. Thank you. As you can see, we need all of these people in order for us to make change, right? The private sector, the public sector, researchers, and um, uh, you know scientists. And so it takes this whole community approach to actually solve some of these very difficult challenges. Well, uh, thank you for an amazing set of uh, opening remarks. So I'm going to um, ask a question that, you know, hopefully it's not too much of a downer. I mean, we're hearing a lot of optimism here, maybe even triumphalism, Danny, the way you framed it up. 
yes, we are the fifth largest economy in the world, but we are one state among 50. For every California, there's a Texas, there's a Florida, where science, uh, you know, there's a fair amount of uh, questioning and even opposition of having science dictate policy. We've had administrations in the past that have gone from being lukewarm to hostile uh, to scientific research driving um, economic development agendas. And it's not clear that we are out of the woods uh, in terms of what might happen in 2024 or 2028 or in the future. And then there's this global context. This notion of polluting our way to prosperity is something that the United States has done, California has done, and there are other countries with large populations who think that's probably gonna be their future as well. So what can we do in, in little old California here? Yes, we're the fifth largest economy, but we're pretty small in terms of these other jurisdictions and populations to, um, to bend the curve, if you will. Would love to hear anyone's thoughts. We're both from Texas originally, <laughs> so <laughs> maybe it says something that we're not there anymore, but um, there's, there's a lot of great science going on in Texas. So. Texas gets a bad rap. Uh, it's gone crazy in the last 20 years, but it used to not be that way at all. So, I mean, do you feel confident that even places that are resisting right now ultimately, I just wonder what that looks like and where California can play a role or maybe well, not. We just California kinda... is exporting a lot of entrepreneurs to Texas right now, so um, you know it's a more favorable tax environment there. But uh, Texas has always been a, a technology center in different ways, whether it's Houston or Austin or Dallas. Um, I, I think what gets lost is uh, all of the stuff that's going on in those urban centers gets overshadowed by some of the other things that are happening with the stance of the of the government there right now. But I think. As you bring in, eventually it's going to change because when you bring so many intelligent people doing such great things into the ecosystem, it can't help but eventually have an impact there. So I think you know Texas will regain its sanity at some point, um, it, in part because some you know a lot of people are heading to Austin from Silicon Valley and other stuff like that. But um, you know it's. Well, let's talk about the national government then, right? I mean, so if you have, if you get the politicization of the bureaucracy, right. which we've had in the EPA, in many of the science agencies, yes. what, what can we do to be better prepared for even worse swings in the future? Well, I think the, the whipsaw that's going on from a policy perspective um, within the government where we, you know, every four or eight years we're changing administrations and then we're going to the you know, complete opposite side of the spectrum on what the policy is going to be, particularly with environmental policy. Um, that's obviously not sustainable, and that's not good for business either. You know, if you're in a regulated industry and the regulations are swinging back and forth constantly, it's a problem. Um, but I think where we're really going to mitigate that is not by uh, specific policies, but it's by informing people and educating people so that they're making better decisions um, when they go to the you know, the voting booth, and I think it, so much of politics is driven by what they think voters want. And so if voters are saying they want something different there, then the political system will adapt, adapt to that. I can talk about something that I'm very passionate about, data, and how it could help. Because data right now, we don't have the luxury of ignoring it, and with climate, learnings from data and the dynamic changes in all these challenges and the environment and you know policies around that is very fertile ground for progress. It, we can use data as a collaboration. First of all, it needs investments in data infrastructure itself. Data is infrastructure if we can get this in our heads and invest in collaborative data infrastructure that increase collaborations between agencies and stakeholders in this space, we can build tools around that. And once we have that, um, you know, some data is open, some it's not. You know, there are policies around that. These are solvable problems if we mean to solve them. And once we have a federated data system between these agencies and knowledge platforms that turn the data into insights that we can build solutions around, then we are going into a 
form that we can use it to inform public and communicate. We can use it to develop multipliers of solutions, right? This is public solutions, private solutions, government solutions, everything. It's, an, it's a currency at that point that we could use to create solutions at a magnitude we did not even think of building. And one of our missions is actually to turn data into utility, into a utility for many forms and work w within public-private settings and cross-sector settings uh, with entities like Design Lab to create these human-centered ways to actually develop products. And you know, if we can turn those products uh, into things that are used at scale, then I think we are at least solving one part of the challenge, which is how do we inform? Those countries you're saying are looking at you know, continued pasts into the future, I, I disagree. I, fossil fuels, you may have heard this here first, but I will point you to many resources that are saying this about this time, peaked in 2019. The pandemic was the end point of the growth of fossil fuel consumption on this earth. You, you have the IEA this year backing away from triumphalist prognosis of the 2020s when they were claiming that oil would go back over 100 million barrels a day. They're now reforecasting every month a million barrels down and a million barrels down. That's what war's going to do. The shock in the supply side of the economy that this Russian war has caused is the final nail in the coffin of fossil fuel demand. So there's no more systemic growth. There are sporadic points of growth, and there are dumb countries that are going to try to get inside that noise fluctuation and ignore the signal. The United States may be one of those, trying to become Saudi America, just as the oil century ends, you know, dumb decision, but one that we seem to be making in both Republican and Democratic administrations. But the fact of the matter is, we're never going back over 100 million barrels, and coal is gone. I mean, it's going to grow in certain places, but it is not the generating asset of choice anymore for the electricity system. Solar and wind are. 85% of all new additions to the grid last year. 85% of all new additions to the grid last year were solar and wind. You won't find a financier doing a coal-fired power plant unless they're Chinese and they've been told to. Like, that's just what the banks think now. As for oil, forget about it. Upstream oil, if I were, you know, like I'd do investment, right? If I wanted to go drill a new well in Kern County or Alaska, 24% rent on the money. Guess what the project finance cost for a wind or solar farm is in America. Three, four percent. It's, it's done, and the, the big end of town's already baked it in. So, with peak fossils, start of this decade, I'll give you this decade's a woo, you know, like whatever it is. It's pandemics followed by wars, followed by what's going to happen next, including the weird weather and whatever catastrophes come. And the volatility uncertainty makes it very difficult for us to imagine. So, to your question, what can California do in this? Continue to be the light on the hill. Continue to be the state that does do it, and as goes California, so goes America, so goes the world. Continue to use information as power. Continue to be the policy innovators that accept the crisis that's coming and write the Global Warming Solutions Act that stands like a bellwether for the times and dictates what the rest of the world does. What we do at New Energy Nexus is export the innovation culture and entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley and Sand Hill Road and all that, you know, admittedly complicated and nuanced, difficult tech bro VC stuff to places that are going to actually determine the fate of the climate, which are not anymore America. Another weird fact for you is our emissions are flat and declining because of all this adoption of clean energy and our demographics and our economics. You know, we decoupled economic growth from carbon emissions in California before the turn of the century, just for the record. Where the atmosphere will be determined and the parts per million which will d dictate whether it's three degrees, four degrees, or two degrees, is Asia and Africa. The puck is already there. What we have to do as Californians is be a lab for the world, demonstrate what can be done, and export the hell out of it so that the world has solutions to adopt at speed and scale required by the crisis. Great. So one area I would love to see California be a leader in is to actually um, work with um, the most vulnerable populations. Laura, you know this. Disasters often hit 
in places where they're the most vulnerable populations and they're slowest to recover, right? They get the least amount of aid and take longer to recover. So how can we use data to actually address um, climate effects on underserved populations? And how do, we, how do we plan and mitigate for the most vulnerable populations, the elderly, um, low-income communities, minority communities? How do we, how do, we do that? I'll speak to one other thing, um, which is the regulatory environment in California. Now, many people will say, oh, that's why they're leaving and going to Texas and other places. But at the same time, we've managed to accommodate 40 million people, be the fifth largest economy, and still preserve a great part of our environment. And the governor just passed another goal of, what is it, 30, 30 by 30. Is that it? Yeah, I just wanted to get the slang right. Um, but the idea of really preserving our environment, ensuring that we preserve another uh, 30 million acres, is that right? I, I don't remember what 30 by 30 stands for. I'm very 30 embarrassed. 30%, 30 percent, that's right, of, of our, by, tw by 2030. And we're doing that. We have land trusts um, that are, and conservation easements, things that California innovated, uh, uh, you know, just like I was talking about, you know, a safety element. We've had the open space element as part of our general plans forever. Uh, and we have land trusts that have been created that are, are allowing us to preserve our agricultural land and keep our working lands as well as our environmental natural habitat uh, through, through these kinds of, um, kinds of systems where we pay a small amount of fee, um, people invest, <laughs> uh, and we use our philanthropic means um, to you know, buy out the development rights in particular of lots of areas. So where I live up in Marin County, which is just across the Golden Gate Bridge, this is a great example of, I mean, the first legislation was actually fought right on the, uh, or Supreme Court case around the use of conservation easements actually happened in, uh, just in uh, southern uh, Sonoma County, Marin County, uh, where these conservation approaches were starting to take place. There was so much rapid urbanization going on uh, in the Bay Area at the time, and the community said we want to actually preserve our working lands. We want to keep our agriculture close to, to where we live. And that is a movement now that's taking off across the world. As we look at climate change, you know, we, people want to have sustainably locally grown agriculture uh, rather than big international agriculture going on, um, which is highly uh, energy intensive and consumptive. Uh, so I think there are a lot of other, the, there's a regulatory environment piece to California that the world still looks to as well, to kind of go to Karthik's point. Um, and so to build on your question, uh, I, you know, within that, we have also been leading, uh, even AB uh, 32 back in 2006 talked about making sure there was an, there was an environmental justice component. Uh, and we have an environmental justice requirement in our general plans. And are uh, things like planning for hazards now that the doing uh, climate change vulnerability assessments isn't about just looking at the vulnerability of the environment. It's about looking at the vulnerability of the people relative to that change. Uh, and those are the kinds of hooks that you need across you know, your planning processes and your, and your policy making. Uh, and, and some of the recent legislation that's come out around wildfires is really hooking in uh, dealing with smoke and the impacts of the fires on the communities that have been historically hit hard through fossil fuel consumption um, and live near the freeways, really trying to remedy some of that, uh, you know, some of that, uh, our, our, our air quality issues in California and how they affect um, some of our most vulnerable populations. And so we're actually feeding a lot of the wild, some of the wildfire le legislation actually kind of bleeds into dealing with uh, just air quality and environmental justice issues uh, for the populations that really uh, bear the brunt of, of asthma and other effects from the previous 30 years. Quick point on env environmental justice. You know, with the Justice 40 initiative, the Biden administration, I think that's a good example of like kind of California values or, or designs kind of influencing. Right, the federal. So the Justice 40 initiative is that you know 40 percent of climate investments need to be targeted at at uh, disadvantaged communities through something that's akin to the Cal Enviro Screen type exactly. measure. It's using a similar GIS methodology to Enviro Screen for federal allocation. I don't know what the formula is to determine the zip code allocation, but that's that's a great example of California leading the country. So GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, in case. Uh, some of you don't know. I'm going to take some audience questions. 
If it's possible that California can already provide 97% renewable energy on certain days, why is the Utility Commission considering reducing solar panel incentives at the request of Electric and Gas Production Corporation? This comes from AC on Zoom. My answer why is because they're thinking from a past incumbent mindset and they're not doing design thinking about a future which is going to be radically different. Um, to answer your question, we have been protecting these monopoly investor-owned utilities, some of which down here in Southern California do a lot better than some of them up in Northern California in terms of managing the state's public goods and public interest. Um, uh, but why we even have a monopoly regulatory construct like that for power provision is beyond me. I mean, a competitive market is theoretically what America is all about. Uh, and yet we don't do it in this very dynamic market. And, and where you have now competitive electricity markets, even ERCOT, JPM, Australia, you have far greater distributed renewable energy adoption, rooftop solar, for example, um, which is to the benefit of communities and, and poor people because they get to own the assets. The nature of the distributed architecture of energy could be much more pro community um, if it were taken out of the hands of these monopolies. So yeah, I'm with you. Um. OK, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Who has a question? I'm going to take a student question first. I think you're a student. You look like a student. OK. <laughs> I'm gonna Great. Oh, perfect. Uh, thanks uh, for both of your, or for all of your uh, comments. I'm curious. I think there's been a lot of talk about kind of it almost seems like there's an emphasis on private sector leading the way, tech entrepreneurship, and funding. It, that hasn't seemed to work with respect to climate change in a lot of ways. I mean, you think about, first of all, right, so we reached 97% solar. A lot of that, right, we had massive subsidies for the building that type of grid. And if you look at sort of venture capital funding over the past couple of years, there's something like 4% has gone into like green tech as opposed to the billions that are going into like cryptocurrency and blockchain. So if the so if the thesis is that somehow we can, you know, accelerate or incentivize and sort of push out entrepreneurs to make private market feasible solutions to climate change and that's going to work, it the markets don't seem to be paying attention to that signal. So how do you guys think about getting around that? Yeah, this is Danny's territory. I, and it's it's a bridge to something I wanted to address, which is Lithium Valley. Karthik knows this is my pet hobby horse right now. Um, so you're 100% you're right. I mean, do not have faith in the market to deliver us from evil, just for the record. I'm, I may look like the private sector guy and I may manage other people's money and sound off about investments, but by no means is the private sector alone going to do this without being bludgeoned and, kicked and kicking and screaming by state action and community action and social movements who are the real people that make history, just for the record. Markets will follow, um, excuse me, my phone's going off, uh, what the the community wants. Uh, um, my, my thought for you is that California is like the, the archetypal, and I hate to use archetypes because I've been taught by California 100 that those are bad things for design thinking, but uh, an entrepreneurial state. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the book The Entrepreneurial State by Mariana Mazzucato, who you know, I think will go down as the keens of our times. She's the woman who's advising the European Union on their Green Deal. and was the inspiration behind a lot of the Green New Deal thinking of the Sunrise Movement and so on. Basically, when you have state action with private sector action in really creative ways, you create real dynamism and spillover effects in the economy. Case in point, Silicon Valley. You know, the myth of Silicon Valley is that that was like, oh, the genius of Steve Jobs and a few white guys, you know. And, and that they invented everything that we have, the, the supercomputer in my pocket, all that stuff. Silicon Valley is the story of the United States of America facing up against a foe who's very familiar right now called Russia, who was beating us at something called microchips and the digitization of the economy, which was the macro trend of the, its time, right? And we needed better microchips to direct missiles, but bluntly. And so they funded through Department of Defense budgets for decades thousands and thousands of companies. There was a Cambrian explosion of companies that made silicon chips and semiconductors in a place called Palo Alto, around a big research university that had some genius and had cheap land because the agriculture there wasn't very effective. And that thing 
became a consolidation into seven companies, Fairchild and its children, Intel, these names that you might know. And then that thing became the web and the names you do know, like Apple and Google and Facebook and whatever. Trillion dollar companies and the scions of Stanford became the tech bros we were talking about earlier. That huge public good and public value story, which, because I think there is good for everyone there, as well as problems in inequity and tax base and all the rest of it, is a, a function of both state action policy and private sector genius and entrepreneurial type things. And, and my story of Lithium Valley, and I'm sorry, May, if I'm taking too long, is, is that we have this opportunity right now two hours east of here in Southern California, in the poorest county of California, we have the richest resource of what's called geothermal brines for lithium, which is the silicon of the next macro trend in the economy. This century is not going to be about digitization, it's going to be about electrification, because we didn't finish the job in the 20th century of electricity spreading to all end uses. We just did the power grid. We didn't do transport and vehicles. We didn't do industry. We didn't do all the other things we might come up with to do with, with electricity when it becomes super abundant and free and cheap. Because 97% isn't where it stops, by the way. It goes to 100, goes to 150, goes to 200, goes to 300% production of electricity to what we think we need to use, because that's the way you would best manage the grid. And then we have lots of electricity. We need to store it. The way we will store it is in an element called lithium, largely. We have the biggest resource of lithium in the poorest county in California, two hours east of here. Yesterday, we announced a $4 billion deal to start actually producing that at some scale and making homegrown batteries. But what it's going to require to really make homegrown batteries, like Californian lithium for Californian sunshine, driving Californian cars around Californian streets, is policy, is procurement strategies, is the weight of government agencies, of departments of defense's budgets, of all these actions in co collaboration to define that better future. It's not going to just happen because some guy turned up and said, I'm going to spend $4 billion here and build a factory. There needs to be a whole concert of action taken, and it is this entrepreneurial state that I think California is you know, one of the standout places, despite complaints, to do that. I was going to add one thing. Okay, go um, ahead. Sorry, but there's a lot of big problems that we face that industry is not going to support or fund because, in, you know, venture capitalists, and for the most part, are out to make money. They have to return their fund. So there, while they may, there may be some public good that comes from it, and there may be one, you know, VCs that are focused on that, if they've got a bunch of people that gave them, a bunch of LPs that gave them money that they've got to return. Um, so, you know, we can't look to we can look to venture capital to do certain things, but it's not the answer to everything. And the government is going to have a role. Communities are going to have a role. Universities are going to have a role. Nonprofits are going to have a role in a lot of these big societal challenges. And in some cases, the money is going to be hard to come by. We were talking about this earlier on the disinformation topic. So much stuff is focused at the community level. Who's going to pay for that stuff? And that's where the government comes in and a lot of these other organizations is really where we have to band together and figure out ways to, you know, coalesce around certain uh, groupings and consortiums to solve some of these big problems. And I think, you know, companies are going to try to make money first and foremost, and that's probably what you're seeing with that, you know, them trying to get the rollback of policy. It's in their interest to their shareholders or bottom line. Okay, I'm going to let Don Norman, founding director of the Design Lab, take, have the last question. It's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed this uh, panel. But let me stand up. I've enjoyed the panel, but I think you suffer from several problems. One of them is that you're much too logical. And um, the real, the issue is this, that um, people have very, very simple models of causality, and they're linear, and they can understand a feedback loop, but that's about it. And yet this world now is filled with, very, with chaotic systems in the technical sense of chaos, uh, with very complex systems. And people, for example, um, they re people respond very well to crises, but they don't respond at all to prevent it in the first place. We have a problem that people put short term against long term, because long term we can't see. And so one of the problems we face is indeed the problems of policy, 
But first of all, you cannot, you, somebody said we should have more sciences leading policy. That's absolutely wrong. Scientists should not do policy. It's the same statement that we made earlier about products. The researchers are not the people to be the CEOs of really successful companies. And so the purpose of policy decisions by politicians is to weigh these factors. But the other problem we have, and then I'll shut up, is that we have the people in power who are going to be hurt for all the things you're talking about. They're the ones who run the fossil fuels, the coal plants, the, elect the existing electric grid, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why the problem, solar panels, why are we subsidizing solar panels? That would kill our business, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to be much more practical about the human side. Technological issues facing us, we know how to solve. It's human behavior that we have to work on. That is a great closer. I'm going to let Karthik actually close this out. Any any final comments? No, this is, uh, this is precisely the kinds of conversations we need to be having. We're just so um, fortunate uh, to be able to partner with the Design Lab on this journey. So thank you, Mai, for uh, the continued partnership. And, and please, let's continue the conversation. And I also want to thank our sponsors. I think Tad Parzin is here. Is he still here from the Burnham Center? Uh, Tad and the Burnham Center have sponsored Design at Large this quarter. And we also have another sponsor. I'm going to invite Melissa Flocka up here. Thank you. Um, who in the room participated in our Design-a-thon? Oh, lots of people. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, um, we had a lot of fun. Our, I had a lot of fun. I hope you all had a lot of fun, too, thinking about human-centered design and going through the design thinking process with KP um, to help solve the issue of megafires. And tonight, we're going to announce all of, our, all of our posters from all 23 of the project submissions are here in the room and out in the foyer. Um, and we're going to announce the winners who will um, have the opportunity to do a summer internship this summer and to build on the project that they proposed during the design-a-thon. So before I get to the winners, um, first we have the honorable mentions for creativity. We had some amazing, amazing projects, um, and there were some that were just so, so creative. Uh, we had Cycling Through Fires, Embrace the Blaze, Small Sacrifices Save Big, uh, Prescribed to Burn, and Pyro Path, which we would like to honor um, with an honorable mention for their creativity. Congratulations to all of you. And then um, in addition to this, we chose seven projects uh, to move on to the internship part of the process. So we have Become a Burn Boss, Mission Burn Boss, Fire for Kids, Cool Off California, Transforming Fire, Flames for Good, and Board Game on Fire. And so those seven teams um, are going to hopefully work with us over the summer to make your concepts. Thank you for all of your creativity and all of the work that went into the submissions. And I hope folks can stick around and take a look at them. They're fantastic. And we can't wait for them to be a reality. And also, our, our speakers, our panelists, will stick around for an hour. So if you have a question, a burning question, other burning questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know, there's so many puns, right? Fi a cooling question, there you go. We'll, we'll be around for a while, so thank you.